we're here to welcome uh, Jude Verreton, uh, who's a senior lecturer in audio and music technology, who's going to be talking about singing in space and her experience with singing studies and virtual reality and room studies. I think that, that's good enough as an introduction. So that's great. Thank you, Brian. That didn't go through, but this light didn't light up. <laughs> Did you hear it? No. Okay. Okay, good afternoon everybody and firstly to say thank you to Brian for inviting me to talk to everybody this afternoon. Um, my name's Jude Burton. I'm a senior lecturer in the electronic engineering department at the University of York and I think my microphone's gone. No, it's fine, good. Um, which is where we teach music and audio technology at the University of York in England. As Brian mentioned, I'm going to talk about singing in space, or singing in spaces. I'm going to think a little bit about the past, um, think about some historical performance practice, but I'm going to start with an introduction to music and space, and by that I mean acoustic space, not outer space. Um, think about what we know about musical performance in the present, um, as I say, a little bit about the past and what we might think we know about musical performance in the past. And then I'll go back to the present again and talk to you about an ongoing research project I've been involved with for a number of years um, and think forward to the future of music making. So music always happens in some sort of space. And that could be the open air. It could be the echoing spaces of a cathedral. That's York Minster. It could be the meticulously designed concert hall. It could be your own living room. But what we know is that the physical characteristics and the acoustic characteristics of any space really do affect the way that music sounds in that space, both for the listener and the performing musician. Just to illustrate this, I want to play an example of um, a short vocal piece. The first section is recorded in an anechoic chamber, and I know you have one here, we have one at York, so this is a space which is specifically treated so that there are no acoustic reflections at all. And I pressed a button by mistake. <laughs> uh, just given the game away, never mind. Um, <laughs> and then it will move into another space, the same music. So hopefully if I press play on here, this should work. Could everybody hear that? Hopefully you heard a very dry first couple of phrases and then it moved into this space, which is the chapter house of York Minster. It's an octagonal space, very reverberant. I think a six second um, reverberant time there. And the, the sound of the music changed, of course. Um, and that's something we all know instinctively as, as musicians and people interested in music. So an anechoic environment is interesting actually for musicians and here's a quote from a trombone um, player who was involved in a research project 
And part of that research project meant that he had to do some recordings in an anechoic chamber. I will read it. He said, when there is nothing for the sound to bounce off of, it is challenging to hear what you are doing. So as a performing musician in an anechoic chamber. The tendency is to play louder and louder in order to hear yourself and try to create some kind of resonance because we're used to having a resonance of a space. Even a space like this has its own resonance. Dynamic shadings are difficult because of the lack of oral feedback and you end up going as much by the feel of your embouchure as by sound. So, I know many research projects, we will ask our musician friends to come to the Anacote Chamber and play an example of some music and then we can, in the studio later, convolve that, mix that with um, the impulse response, the resonance of a space. And I just want to illustrate something that's really important for me is that that isn't very often a good replication of what that music would have, lis uh, would have sounded like if it had been um, performed in that space. So what do I mean by this? So here's um, a trumpet player. No, it isn't. That's the impulse response. Okay, here's a trumpet player. <laughs> Okay, that's a trumpet player playing a baroque trumpet with no vowels, and he's really, really struggling in the anechoic chamber. He is a good trumpet player, actually. <laughs> I won't say who it is. Um, and then, of course, we can measure um, or we can capture an impulse response. You won't hear very much. This is a small room, but um, I'll play it again. Okay, so there's a little bit of resonance there to, to that small room. And then we can mix the two and say, da-da, here's um, a, a trumpet playing performance in that small room. Okay, let's have a listen to what this sounds like. Okay, I'll stop it there. So it, it sounds like somebody struggling to play the trumpet in an anechoic chamber mixed with the, the resonance, the acoustic of a, of a small room. And, and that to me is the essence of what we're trying to get to grips with is the idea that a musician performing in a space will change the, the way they perform that piece according to the space that they are performing in. And for me, I really want to investigate singing performance. And there's a number of reasons for this, um, which I'll go into a bit later. My overriding research question is really, how do singers alter their performance according to the room acoustics of the performance venue? Why do I want to understand this better? Well, it has implications for musical training. It has implications for performance practice. It has implications for composition. And it allows us perhaps to understand historical perspectives on performance practice as well. And it also allows us to start to think forward into the future and what future innovations we might be able to make in music making. Why do I work with singers all the time? Well, I, I sing a little bit myself. I wouldn't call myself a, a singer, a professional singer by any means, but singers are perhaps oral detectives. So Blesser and Salter um, say singers investigate the acoustics of a room the way that a child investigates a toy. And I, I, I do think that's a really nice quote and I've found it to be very true working with singers over the last 15, 20 years. So singers' vocal output changes according to their environment. And that could be in terms of tempo, musical dynamics, intonation, tuning, timbre. But 
for singers and for most musicians, actually, there are sort of two sets of different things going on. There's the automatic response system. So this is what singers and other musicians will do intuitively or instinctively. So if you go into any big cathedral, even just speaking to friends in the space, you will slow down your speech rate because of the long reverberation time makes um, comprehension difficult if you were to speak more quickly. So that's sort of what I might call an instinctive response to an acoustic. But then there's a lot of what we could call the acquired feedback loop. So this is what singers and other musicians learn to do as part of their musical training in response to the different um, acoustic spaces in which they have to perform. And that's probably something that you would practice during rehearsals. So what happens to singers in our anechoic chambers? And I think both Brian and Sarah Beth and other people in the room and myself have done this, haven't we? We've got singers to come into the anechoic chamber to record. I thought I'd, I'd just say a few words about this. For a singer, what the, the main thing that happens in an anechoic chamber is we don't have any acoustic reflections. So the feedback loop, this feedback loop I've just been talking about, the automatic and the learnt feedback loop, the balance in that feedback loop is disturbed. So there is very little airborne sound of the singer's own voice. So in a room like this, if I were to sing in here, I would be able to hear my own singing voice directly from the mouth to my own ears, but then also the reflections from the room. In an anechoic chamber, you don't have any of the reflections from the room to help with that airborne vocal sound, um, to, to contribute to that airborne vocal sound coming to the ears. So that means that the balance of bone-conducted vocal sound, so the vocal sound being produced here in the larynx and the vocal tract is conducted through the bones and, and also the skin to a certain extent to the inner ear. And for the singer then, it means that the balance in an anechoic room is shifted very much towards this bone-conducted sound. Bone-conducted sound is low-pass filtered, so the higher um, parts of the spectrum, uh, higher frequencies of the spectrum are dampened. Overall, the amplitude um, seems lower, so singers tend to force the voice. They tend to put more air through the vocal folds um, and put the vocal fo folds under higher stress. And this has an implication for the, the timbre, the, the sound quality of the voice, as well as intonation and many other things. So I think um, putting singers in an anechoic chamber, or indeed any musicians in an anechoic chamber, really does underline the idea that acoustic space affects the way we perform music. So I want to talk now a little bit about my doctoral work that I did. And it was actually, I was going to say seven years, it's nine years ago. <laughs> Brian and I were, we were saying earlier this morning, everything is plus two because we sort of feel like we've lost two years due to um, COVID-19. But um, nine years ago now, and I know some of the things I, I talk about, um, the research, the state of the art, art research has moved on a little bit. But uh, I did think it was useful just to say a few things about what I did um, about investigating this relationship between space and singing. So how could we go about um, investigating space in different acoustic venues? So this is what I hope to do. Go around Europe to some venues with a bunch of singers, maybe some friends, um, go to a few nice concert halls, maybe some cathedrals, make lots of recordings, probably have some coffee and beer along the way, um, and, and sort of ask singers what they, what they did differently and ask them what they felt about those different venues. Um, we didn't do that, didn't get the money, sorry, also pandemic. Um, but instead, <laughs> we did other things. I used what you might call an engineering system approach. Okay, so if we can model and understand and analyze and understand every component in the overall music performance system, then we can start to um, answer this question. So that means capturing, recording, measuring, analyzing the acoustics of a space, 
being able to replicate that space in the lab or the listening space or whatever we call um, that place where we have all of the loudspeakers that we like to put our singers into and to do that in real time so to try and replicate the acoustic venue that we've not been able to travel to capture and measure and analyze parameters of the musical performance that they produce in that lab space in that listening space and that allows us then to investigate the relationship between space and musical performance so here's the um, venue that that i had to work with a few years ago i was very lucky in york um, that a number of nearly 20 years ago now um, this venue here is an old medieval church in the center of York and it was used as a theater store and it was renovated and refurbished in about 2000, the year 2000. And now it's a, a concert venue, a small concert ven venue and houses the National Center for Early Music in York. I say I was lucky because um, I'm actually in that photo somewhere. I was there on this day. And this is not um, Raf Orlovsky from Arab Acoustics killing the harpsichordists. No harpsichordists were harmed in the making of this photo. Um, but this was a, a photo for the local newspaper um, to demonstrate that we were thinking about the acoustics of this space when the renovations happened. And the venue itself, the space itself, is fitted with uh, adjustable acoustic panels in the walls and they're difficult to see because they're black against a black ceiling um, but some acoustic drapes in the in the church ceiling the um, the vaulted ceiling there um, this is just to give you an overview of what the space is like there's a floor plan and it's sort of um, 12 meters from from side to side and sorry 19 meters from side to side and 12 meters from front to back the um, adjustable panels on the walls means that you can set different acoustic settings for the space. There are many of them and I chose to work with three, um, the two extremes and something in the middle. So they're called large choral, music recital setting and speech setting. As you'll imagine, the speech setting has the driest acoustic, so it's a quoted RT60 time of 1.3 seconds and the large choral is 2.2 seconds at one kilohertz. So a bit of a difference, not a huge difference, but enough, I think, to, to make a difference in speech, between speech and choral music, and then something in the middle as well. I recorded um, impulse responses, so I recorded the acoustics of the space from four different positions to sort of um, uh, simulate where singers might stand if they were in a singing quartet and then a couple of listener positions in the audience area. Just to give you an idea of the sort of acoustic of the space, um, so this is the T30 values, the reverberation time values across um, from in octave bands from 125 hertz octave band up to the 8k octave band at the right hand side here. And this sort of domed shape across the spectrum uh, where you've got more resonance sort of in the, in the mid frequencies and then dying off towards the top end of the spectrum is very um, commonly found, I think, in this sort of style of medium sized medieval church. Brian's nodding, I think, you, yeah, it, we, we come across this often. Okay. Just to show you the difference between the three settings that I chose, the red setting there is a speech setting, so a lot drier across the spectrum. Um, the green at the top is a large choral, um, a bigger acoustic, and then music recital sort of somewhere in the middle. There wasn't, however, too much difference between um, the reverberation times that we measured between a listener position, which is the black line there, and the performer position, which is the purple line. Um, I wasn't too surprised about this because unlike a concert hall, there isn't a physical stage area. 
in the church. It's very flat. And actually, I've been to many concerts there, and people who are performing tend to stand in different places, um, probably because there's not that much difference between um, the, the sound for the performer on the stage area and the sound for the listener in the, in the audience area. Um, and then we rigged up uh, a sort of listening space. Uh, originally, I did it with 16 loudspeakers, um, and then we dug into the floor. I don't know if you can see on this picture, but that's actually a grid uh, mesh, metal mesh, um, and there are speakers under the floor now, and we've now got 50 loudspeakers. Um, and Elliot, this is what we call the Thunderdome. <laughs> we call it the Thunderdome. <laughs> okay, so that's what we did. So we're giving the, 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 the acoustic to the singer in real time um, over loudspeakers so we can ask our singers to sing in here rather than an anechoic chamber and we can see what they do differently. First thing I wanted to do was to make sure that um, the simulation, so the virtual space that I'd produced was um, similar to the real venue. Okay, so I was able to take my singers to the real venue in York, but also to have them in the lab with the virtual venue. And this is just some qualitative um, responses here. It was much more realistic than I thought it would be. I think that's what you call a sort of faint phrase. <laughs> I thought it was going to be awful, but it was actually fine. Okay, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> and also the singer said, I was surprised when I sang in the real venue. I'm hoping that's good surprised <laughs> rather than really bad surprised. Um, we also gathered lots of quantitative data on singers' perception as well, but uh, there's no time for that in today's talk, but do ask me if you want to later. Okay. What I was really most interested in finding out was did singers sing differently between the large choral um, reverberant setting and the speech setting and, and the, the, the middle setting as well. So we can start to investigate this question of how do singers change their performance according to different acoustics. Um, I wanted to check actually that the singers could tell the difference between the three acoustic settings. Uh, so we did some ANOVAs and some stats and yes, all of these were signif uh, statistically significant. So the perception of the amount of reverberation, the ease of maintaining tempo. Tempo is one of the main things, isn't it? When we have a big reverberant acoustic, it would affect the tempo. Perception of clarity and the sense of envelopment all um, the singers could tell the difference between the three settings, definitely there. Okay, this, this is the, the real um, question, the, the nub of the question, is what impacted the different singing that I recorded? So singers singing the same piece in the three different settings in the real and the virtual um, venues. So the question is, did the acoustic affect the performance and did the um, simulation, the real or the virtual, did that affect the performance as well? And rather than just asking them, I mean, I did ask them, you know, how did you perform differently in the different settings? I recorded their singing and I analyzed a number of performance parameters and I'll go on to talk about those. I'm not expecting you to read all the words in this table, please don't worry about that, but I did want to just illustrate that in music performance analysis now, there are many different um, parameters that we can capture and analyze. And these fall into four main categories. So at the top there, we've got sort of tempo and timing. So things to do about um, the tempo that we perform, the, 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 the temporal space between notes. So I actually looked at the note, what you could call the note on ratios as the start of notes to the next note and that allows you to calculate tempo. You can calculate tempo across a whole piece, you can calculate tempo across a phrase, or you can calculate local tempo. So the tempo, as it were, for each note, and see how that varies within a phrase. And I did both of those things. And then there's lots of parameters around loudness and intensity, sound pressure levels as well. I didn't do that so much, but I did want to look at pitch and intonation. So I actually analyzed vibrato, both in terms of rate and extent, and intonation, accuracy, and precision. I'll explain a little bit more about 
all of those now and say a little bit about some of my headline results. I'm not going to go into all of them. I'll be, oh, we'll be here all day, <laughs> so I'll just say a few things. So for tempo, um, so this is uh, one phrase of one singer from the same piece singing all these different settings and just lining up the beats and then calculating the local tempo for all of those um, all of those notes across a phrase. Um, there's one outlier there. I'm not quite sure what happened with that blue one. Maybe they forgot how to sing that song. Um, what I what I found is that global tempo range from sort of 60 BPM to 77.6 BPM, um, but there didn't seem to be anything in the acoustic which was sig statistically significant in terms of um, singers t changing the tempo of the piece they were performing. Um, that wasn't terribly surprising to me because I don't think there's a huge difference between those acoustic settings in terms of reverberation time. Um, so singers tended to, to sing at a fairly um, uh, sort of strict tempo, as it were, across the different settings. If we look at vibrato, um, in all of the singers that I used, there were six of them. Um, these are all classically trained singers and mostly um, singers who would tend to sing early music, so 16th, 17th, early 18th century music, rather than operatic um, voices. Um, but their vibrato rate um, seemed to be between 6 and 8 hertz consistently, which is what we see in the literature, actually, for, for this type of singing, a vibrato rate of between 6 and 8 hertz. Um, the mean vibrato extent, so the measure of the, sort of the top and the bottom of the vibrato curve, um, ranged wildly between 35 cents and 169 cents. So it didn't seem that useful to, to think about mean vibrato. Instead, I, th I thought about medium vibrato, which was a lot more consistent across the singers. Um, the acoustic, so whether it was large choral speech or, or middle, had a significant effect on the medium vibrato extent. That was quite an interesting result. It was a small effect, but it was si significant. It might be worth say saying, actually, if you look at this vibrato curve, this is just one note. You I think you can tell from this that these are early music specialists. I think if these were operatic singers, you would expect to see a vibrato that was much more regular and that started pretty much at the beginning of the note and ended at the end of the note. A sort of on-off vibrato is more um, consistent with operatic style of singing, whereas in early music, um, you might use vibrato as an ornament, as a decoration for a note. So you, you, you could maybe have more control over when that vibrato actually came in during the note. Okay, let's um, think about intonation. So I wanted to, to think of intonation, uh, investigate this in terms of what my singers were doing in the different acoustics. And there's three different things that I measured, and I think this, this diagram here from, from this paper is a really nice illustration. So in A there, you can see this is an illustration of singing that is inaccurate but precise. What do we mean by that? So the, the horizontal line, might represent that the note that a singer sh should be singing, according to the score, um, but they're not singing that note, but they're being pretty precise. They're replicating the same note quite um, consistently. So they're precise but inaccurate. B here is accurate but imprecise. So they're sometimes hitting the right note on that middle line there, but often then they're not getting the, the pitch correct. So that's imprecise singing. But you could also be inaccurate and imprecise. Don't ever say that to a singer, by the way. Won't go down well, <laughs> but it's true. Inaccurate and imprecise. So, so you don't very often hit the right note. And also the ones where you don't hit the right note, you're not hitting the same wrong note all the time either. So imprecise and inaccurate. So these are three different things. Um, and the reason that I did this is Pitch precision, okay. So I knew what pitch they were supposed to be singing because I had the score of the pieces they performed. Um, so, so that's fine, we can do that, we can do pitch precision. However, 
Um, these were unaccompanied singers in the listening space, Thunderdome. Um, and they didn't necessarily always start the piece on the right note. <laughs> okay, um, So if you don't have absolute or perfect pitch, you might start in an approximation to the G that you were meant to start the, the piece on. So did I want to then say, well, actually, that person started on the wrong note, So and then everything they do is now imprecise and inaccurate. Uh, that, sound, that felt a little bit harsh to me. I wanted to reward, well not reward them, but I wanted to know that actually if they started on a G that wasn't quite a G that we'd expect, that, but they otherwise sang in tune, then, then I wanted to measure that. So, that was, so I looked at interval accuracy instead. So in effect, the, the starting note had no effect on the analysis, it was more the, the measure of the, sh the size of the intervals. And similarly for interval precision, um, because, I mean, we could debate for the rest of the afternoon if singers sing in equal temperament, okay? So I was working off a score, and I could calculate in equal temperament um, the size of the intervals, but were the singers actually singing in equal temperament? Probably not. But if they were being precise with the size of the intervals, I wanted to know about that as well. So three different things there. Okay, sorry, that was quite long-winded. But <laughs> it's, uh, it's interesting what happened. So pitch precision was about 40.5 cents, um, which is half a semitone. <laughs> okay, um, Interval accuracy... Um, better than that, 24.6 cents, a sort of quarter tone, and interval precision was 33.6 cents. Uh, intonation accuracy and precision actually were different between the real and the virtual venue. And that was quite interesting to me. Why would it be that you would sing um, with different intonation pattern in a real venue? in relation to a virtual venue, given that I had hoped that my virtual reconstruction was, was pretty authentic and pretty plausible. And in fact, even more surprising is that my singers were less accurate and less precise in the real venue, not the virtual venue. So something was happening when I took my singers to the real venue that made them sing less well in tune with worse intonation. We can, we can discuss that later, <laughs> or that might be. <laughs> okay, um, again, just a really quick overview of, of the other significant effects that I've, I've found. So as I mentioned earlier, um, vibrato extent seemed to be uh, a, a small but significant effect of the different acoustic. And um, intonation accuracy here, this is um, significant between the real and the virtual. But then I put this up really um, to, sh to show you another aspect of musical performance and how it changes. So one of my singers sang a song, a folk song, with multiple verses. And every verse had a different emotional intention. Okay, as many folk songs do, you know, you start with, uh, uh, no, I'm not going to go into that, but you know what I mean, <laughs> you start with something and then somebody dies and then it's all sad at the end, but it's happy in the middle. Yeah, you get the idea. So each verse has a, a different, a very different emotional content. So look what happens on, on their singing. So actually vibrato extent is significant and quite a large effect and global tempo. So the tempo of the whole verse, again, a large and significant effect. So this is reminding us that yes, singers and musicians will perform differently in different acoustics, but we've also got an added layer of complication when we're dealing with music in that the emotional intent, the musical emotional intent is very real and very present and also has an effect on how singers might um, articulate a phrase, how they may slow down or speed up or indeed change their vibrato pattern. Okay, so that led me to think a little bit about, these have all come in a different weird order, so I'm just going to do this. Um, the three main um, acoustic parameters, stage acoustic parameters that we can look at, how we measure them, and what this 
means in terms of musicians and how they might perform. So we'll go through these. So early support energy is, is a stage acoustic that tries to capture the ratio of direct sound, so the sound coming directly from the performer, and the early reflections, so that the reflected sound in the early part of the room um, response. And this corresponds to being able to hear yourself. Um, I was mentioning earlier, when we, when we sing in choirs now, because of COVID, we all stand <laughs> far away from each other and the choir is much more spread out. And that really does change the balance of how much you can hear yourself and how much you can hear the uh, next person singing and also which early reflections you're actually going to get depending on where you're standing in the venue as well. So early reflections are important to be able to hear yourself. Late support then is a ratio of direct sound and the later reflected sound, so the later bit of the impulse response of the room. Um, and that allows you to hear others on the stage, um, especially impo important if you're performing in an ensemble. And then another um, acoustic characteristic we might measure is strength, overall strength. And that's just capturing the sort of overall level of sound in the room compared to if we were to make that same sound in an anechoic chamber or outside in a big field. Um, and that's about hearing the hall. So that's what, as performers, we do. Um, we listen to, to try and imagine what the audience impression is, is at any one time. And they all fit together for me. I tried to capture it in, in this diagram is this sort of, we've got the emotional content of a, of a musical performance right at the center. And you need to be able to hear yourself to, to, to know what you're doing with that. Um, and and agogics and dynamics and musical phrasing are right at the center of what we do when we perform music. And then there's like layers o over the top of that. So there's musical structure layers and room acoustics. And then these three things that I've just talked about, hearing yourself, hearing others, and hearing the hall. Okay, um, I'm going to go quite briefly think about the past, how people perform music in the past. This is not my specialist area, um, and there are many more people in the room, and maybe online, who know more about this than I do. But I thought it's worth just, just having a think. Um, is there a causal relationship between musical composition and architectural space? Um, so it's difficult to pinpoint what that causal relationship might be um, and how it might influence the development of any musical style for a particular place. But I think most people agree that th there's probably a co-evolution of architectural spaces and the musical compositions that were produced within them. Okay, and that's very much what Sarah Beth is looking at, isn't it? Um, it's worth remembering that historically, composers had to rely on their own oral memory of spaces. They didn't go and um, capture impulse responses and, and analyze them in the lab like we can. But it's hard to imagine that, that composers didn't um, consider the acoustic space for which they were composing. Just a couple of projects to outline, and do go away and have a look at them if you're, if you're not aware of them already. So in 2007, uh, St. John's College Choir from Cambridge, um, they did get the money to go to Venice, and <laughs> we'll talk to them later, work out how. <laughs> and they did a big project uh, with Deborah Howard and Laura Moretti um, to um, not only perform in, in Renaissance churches in Venice, but also record the acoustics and record the performances as well. Um, they took acoustic measurements and they recorded at lots of different positions in those venues. And this is especially interesting in Venice, of course, because there's this tradition of split choir or coro spettato in St. Mark's um, Basilica in particular. They wanted to investigate that. Um, and they surveyed the audience members as well. Okay, so um, Laura Moretti actually writes about this um, in 2004, so before they did this project. 
um, Zarlino in 1558 was talking about um, St. Mark's Basilica and Adrian Willett's compositions for double choir as particularly suited to performance by two spatially separated groups of singers, if not even specially composed with that aim. And she says, given that they are written in a polyphonic idiom consisting of harmonically self-sufficient sections. I thought that was really interesting, actually, because what she's doing there is taking musical content, the harmonic and musical content of the, the pieces written there, as evidence for the acoustic properties of the space. Which is sort of the other way around to, to what we normally do. Um, you can go online and hear some of these um, recordings in the spaces in Venice. And hopefully if I do this, you'll be able to hear. Um, this is one of the um, Willett um, <coughs> a composition, Domine Probastime, and it's for double fo forces. So we've got a choir in um, opposite sides in, in a pergola each. Um, so this is a, a high up sort of choir area in the Basilica in St. Mark's. Um, and just struggling to make it work. Here we are. My I just want to put the quote back on. Um, so I, th I think here it's, y you can very much hear, maybe not so much in this room, but the, the left to right interplay. Um, and I think the quote is interesting. The assembled congregation in the nave could hear the music as from far away, as if it were coming down from heaven. Um, I'm going to skip this because I'm running out of time a little bit, but there is a, a really nice project called the Virtual Haydn Project that came out of McGill University, um, where Tom Bevan, who's a harpsichordist, plays on a number of different instruments from the time and a number of different rooms that we know that Haydn performed in or composed for are, um, are captured and uh, replicated in the lab. And there's a whole... Um, CD, DVD available as well. So do, do have a look at that um, at some point. I want to say a little bit more about singing style and space um, and not to go into this too much. But, y you know, I mentioned opera in operatic singing style earlier. And again, there's a connection between the acoustic space and, and that sort of operatic uh, singing style that ensues. It really is this, this um, large and on-off vibrato, maybe, that we see in operatic singing. And um, the singer's formant, which is illustrated here, this use of a sort of extra resonance in the voice between three and four kilohertz. These are byproducts of um, the need to make a big sound in a big concert hall with a big orchestra and large audiences. Okay, And it just stems from the physiology of the voice. So the if if you're pushing the voice a lot, then uh, the vibrato is as a sort of physiological byproduct of that, perhaps. And the singer's formant was a way of getting acoustic energy across the sound of the orchestra. The orchestra does not have much acoustic energy in this area, and also directly into the ear of the audience. Um, if we think about the 20th century, when recording studios became more prevalent and these really dry acoustics 
um, of, of recording studios and broadcasting studios. Um, so early 20th century singing style, if you, if you listen to old recordings, there's a lot of portamento, so there's a lot of gliding from one note to another. And you could, you could imagine that this was a sort of way for singers to fill in the, the acoustic that was missing. Because <laughs> otherwise the sound, if, if you break up the notes more, the, s the sound stops dead uh, and it's really quite odd. And a, a narrow, rapid vibrato, there's some evidence that that was a byproduct of the recording techniques of the time as well, a way of, of making that, that work. Um, and
<laughs> Not have a question. <laughs> I just bamboozled everybody. <laughs> study that I don't know. So you had someone who composed for a specific room. Did you replay that music in a room that was much less reverberation? I think to me that would be interesting to hear how it sounds different or to to give uh, a listener survey and, and let people adjust the reverb and see do people actually choose the reverb kind that it was composed for. Or do they choose something else that is more suitable to the Yeah, so is this on now? Yeah, okay. Um, so Architecture 3 was where we, we first started sort of um, experimenting with the, the moving of acoustics. What do we want to do with Architecture 4, which is coming up um, this summer and beyond, is uh, sort of what you said. So we, we compose... Um, Ambrose composes a composition for a particular space, but then we also give um, perhaps the audience members who could be a remote audience the opportunity to place that composition that they're hearing on in real time in a different space. Mm -hmm. And then collect that data, collect that user data, which is what you can do with game an analytics, and actually um, investigate then what audience members actually do. So do they always put this, this part of the composition in a really big reverberant space? Do they always put this part of the composition in a smaller space? That would be really interesting. That's, that's what we're hoping to do this summer, yeah. Come along, join in. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm a little curious what drove the selection of the musical features that you looked at to analyze the performance. For instance, was it informed by the kind of performance practice that would happen in the era that you're looking at, uh, assuming they use a specific type of vibrato? Is that stuff well documented enough for you to say, you know, that this type of vibrato is better suited for this yeah. era? Yeah, so it was a combination, I think as you suggest, you know, the sort of things that we know singers do differently in that sort of music, um, but also, you know, building on what other people, I'm not the only person working in this area of music performance analysis and what other people had been, had. you want to be able to compare your results with, with other people's results as well, that's always important, isn't it? Um, and and, and I, I guess a, a little bit of intuition as well. <laughs> there are so many different things you could record and analyze, but you, there's not enough time in the world, but but I think mostly, as you suggest, you know the sorts of things, the vibrato and the tempo, and the tuning that that we know that musicians who perform that sort of music are interested in. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.